A 23-year-old Laurentian University music student who wanted to become a teacher, Sweeney was stabbed to death by a male just before the lunch hour on a weekday, the killing occurring in the adult video store where she was working. The store was located in a strip mall on, arguably, one of the busiest streets in Greater Sudbury, Paris Street. The man accused of murdering Sweeney, Robert Stephen Wright, will have his long-awaited Superior Court judge and jury trial, just over four years from the date of his arrest in North Bay in mid-December of 2018, and just over 25 years from when Sweeney was murdered. The trial has been booked to last five weeks. For Kim Sweeney, Renee's sister, the trial cannot come soon enough. There's a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff people don't realize, she said in an interview with the Sudbury Star two years ago. It's not something cut and dry, an arrest is made and the trial is held. It's a long waiting game. The frustration of the length of time waiting to get to trial really weighs down on you. Kim said she understands the process must be followed as an accused heads to trial, but in this case, it has taken too long. The support of the community is really important, she said. There's really nobody left in my family. I am relying on the community to help me get through this. Kim's mother and stepfather are both deceased and Renee was her only sibling. The younger sister said that when Renee was murdered, she did not feel safe in the years that followed, worrying that Renee's killer would also go after her. Kim said that when she learned about how her sister died, it shocked her and continues to upset her to this day. What happened on that day, it wasn't necessary, she said. It didn't need to go down that way. That was my sister, my mom's daughter. She had friends. She was a good student. She was a good person. My kids don't have an aunt to take them for ice cream and spoil them. I don't have any nieces and nephews to spoil. Veteran local criminal lawyer William Beach, who has been practicing law for 51 years, said so-called the Jordan ruling is in the background of every case. Beach said that while the lengthy period of time it took to get to the actual trial for Wright could favor the Crown's case, Jordan is always a major consideration. Jordan refers to a ruling in 2016 by the Supreme Court of Canada that an accused should expect to have his or her trial within a reasonable period of time, 18 months, between the charges and the trial in a provincial court without a preliminary inquiry, or 30 months in other cases. The ruling concerned the case of Barrett Richard Jordan, who was arrested and charged in December 2008 in a drug case. Jordan went to trial in 2013, bringing the time between the charges and the conclusion of the trial to 49.5 months, or almost five years. With the right case, though, there were two defense teams involved in four attempts made for bail. There was also a change of venue hearing. As well, the COVID-19 pandemic essential shut down Ontario courts essentially shut down from February to the summer of 2020. Retired local lawyer Herve Sav, who spent 23 years in the Sudbury Crown Attorney's office, including 18 as Crown Attorney, said he might just attend the trial to get a glimpse of Wright just to see how he looks. Sav said that with a case that is 25 years old, memories can fade, but, he added, when a person witnesses something unique such as a murder scene, that image never goes away. He's there, Sweeney's killer as you are entering the story where she worked and you are seeing him go out, and you go in and there's been a murder, he said. Your memory is good as to what you saw. Sav said DNA testing today is far more advanced than when he was a prosecutor. I don't know what type of DNA evidence they police investigators have, but today, it's very different than in my day, he explained. If there was blood, you couldn't say whose it was. Sav, who also spent time in private practice as a criminal lawyer, said the defense team in the case will have to push witnesses who reportedly saw Wright and highlight any uncertainty about what they saw. He had curly hair, but in fact at the time, it was a different type of haircut, said the veteran lawyer. You stress something that's different from witness remarks. To better understand the Sweeney murder case, it is helpful to go back and review the events around the time of the murder and then what happened with Wright following his arrest. While there is a publication ban in place covering Wright's court appearances, there is information out in the public realm that dates back to the time of the murder. Sweeney was stabbed to death while working alone at the adults-only video store on Paris Street. Two friends, dropping by to visit, found her at about 11.30 a.m. January 17, 1998. A suspect, who was still there, ran past the pair and out the door. He was also seen running on a sidewalk by a woman. Not long after the murder, Sudbury Regional Police, now Greater Sudbury Police announced they had their man, John Fetterly, 31. Several days later, 
federally is released and his murder charge gone. The search for Sweeney's killer resumes. In a broad appeal to the public, police issue two posters, the first featuring a turquoise-colored High Sierra Spring slash fall jacket with dark blue collar with what appears to be bloodstains on many sections. The jacket, found with a diaper or safety pin inside the left breast section, was sold exclusively at Mervyn's department store in the United States in 1994 or 1995. Also highlighted on the poster are a predominantly black with white trim and laces Brooks running shoe, approximate size 8 to 10, a universally sized white cotton glove, and the diaper pin. A male suspect is described as being tall, thin, white, in his early 20s, 5 foot 10 to 6 feet tall, with short dark hair, and wearing glasses. The poster offers up to a $25,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the persons responsible for Sweeney's murder. The second poster was an artist's conception of the face of the killer, a young, clean-shaven male wearing glasses and with short hair. Police later asked hundreds of men in the city identified as suspects to voluntarily provide a blood sample so they can be ruled out in the investigation. Civil liberties concerns are raised about what will happen to the sample results after testing. No one is charged and the case goes cold from that point. In early 2017, Greater Sudbury Police released a new composite sketch compiled by Parabon Nanolabs, a DNA technology company in the United States, using its snapshot DNA phenotyping technology, which attempts to predict appearance and ancestry from DNA samples. The composite sketch features a male of Northern European heritage with fair skin, blue-slash-green eyes, brown-slash-blonde hair, and some freckles. No arrest results. Then, out of the blue, more than 20 years later after the killing, there is a surprise breakthrough. Former Greater Sudbury resident Robert Stephen Wright, now living and working in North Bay, is arrested December 11, 2018, and charged with first-degree murder. Wright was 18 and a student at Lockerbie Composite School at the time of Sweeney's murder. He was working as a laboratory technician at North Bay Regional Hospital when police arrested him. Burke Keeney, then Wright's lawyer, issued a brief statement, stressing the allegation against his client remains to be proven. Wright is denied bail in 2019, 2020, and 2022. Wright filed a bail review application. Regional Justice Patrick Boucher, on January 17, 2022, ruled, I do not have jurisdiction to conduct a bail hearing de novo, a legal term meaning from the new, concerning the hearing held on December 17, 2021. The application is denied. The Sudbury Crown Attorney's Office applies to the province's Attorney General for a direct indictment against Wright, which would send him directly to trial, skipping a preliminary hearing. The AG granted the direct indictment in August 2019, but on the lesser charge of second-degree murder, implying the killing was not planned. At the same time, the Crown lost its application to have the defense team of Keeney and Michael Venturi removed as Wright's counsel due to a conflict of interest. Superior Court Justice John Fregio dismissed the application in February 2020. On July 20-21, 2020, Keeney and Venturi seek a change of venue for Wright's trial. It fails. I am confident that an impartial jury can be chosen anywhere in the Northeast region using these tools in this case, Superior Court Justice Gregory Ellis ruled. Keeney announced he is stepping down as Wright's lawyer at a pretrial motions meeting October 12, 2021. In a statement, Keeney said that for the purpose of clarity and accuracy, I declared a conflict and all parties agreed that it would be proper for me to step aside as lead counsel. Michael Lacey, a well-known criminal lawyer from Toronto, and no stranger to the Sudbury Courthouse, takes over. Lacey said he will need time to get up to speed. As a result, the trial, which had been set to start October 25, 2021, is delayed. It is rescheduled to September 12, 2022, but later pushed back again. In mid-February of this year, Lacey wins the right to seek leave to appeal to the Ontario Court of Appeal concerning Justice's Boucher ruling. However, a three-judge panel ruled against the appeal in March. If the panel had agreed with Lacey's arguments, Wright would have been released on bail prior to his trial. The judge and jury trial for Wright is set to get underway at the Sudbury Courthouse in February. If convicted of second-degree murder, Wright, now 43, will receive an automatic life sentence. The only issue to be decided at that point is his parole eligibility. If convicted of manslaughter, he would receive a fixed-time sentence. Since Wright has been in custody for more than four years, he will receive six-plus years of pretrial custody credit, 
which will reduce his parole eligibility waiting period if he receives a life sentence. In the case of a manslaughter conviction, the pretrial custody credit would cut a major chunk of time out of his prison sentence. Wright also came down with COVID-19 while in custody and spent time recovering in a Toronto hospital. The Sudbury Jail, where he had been staying, was temporarily closed due to a COVID-19 outbreak in the fall of 2021. Inmates were relocated to other correctional facilities across Ontario. If Wright is convicted, expect his contracting COVID-19 and the long period he spent in custody during the pandemic to come up in sentencing and for Lacey to seek additional pretrial custody credit. U.S. Army PFC Amanda Gonzalez, 19, was looking forward to sharing her life and love with her daughter, who would have been born on March 26, 2002, according to a reward flyer. A Florida man has been arrested and charged in connection to the murder of a pregnant soldier at a former U.S. Army base in Germany 21 years ago, according to the Department of Justice. On Tuesday, Shannon L. Wilkerson, 42, was arrested in the Northern District of Florida in connection with the murder of U.S. Army PFC Amanda Gonzalez, 19, the Department of Justice said in a statement. Wilkerson is charged with one count of first-degree murder in Gonzalez November 3, 2001, slaying at Fleergerhorst Kasern, a U.S. Army base in Hanau, Germany. Wilkerson was a member of the armed forces at the time of the slaying but was later discharged from the Army, according to the DOJ statement. He was discharged from active duty in 2004 and from the Army Reserve in 2007, according to a grand jury indictment, Stars and Stripes reports. Gonzalez was 19 years old and four months pregnant when she was killed, the FBI said in a previous release. She was on her first assignment in the Army and was assigned to Headquarters Supply Company, 127th Aviation Support Battalion as a cook at the time of her death, according to a 2008 statement from the U.S. Army Criminal Investigation Command. Her body was found on the floor of her third-floor barracks room on November 5, 2001, when she failed to show up for work. The death was ruled a homicide by asphyxiation, CID said in the statement. Gonzalez had only been in Germany for eight months when she was killed, the U.S. Army CID said. In 2008, CID wrote in the statement that it was offering a $100,000 reward to anyone with information leading to the apprehension and conviction of the person or persons responsible for her death. Increasing the reward to $100,000 is a testament to the determination we have in solving this case and bringing the person or persons responsible to justice, CID spokesman Chris Gray said in 2008. The reward was increased to $125,000 in 2011. We are confident that someone out there knows something about the untimely death of this soldier and her unborn child, and we are not giving up. We strongly encourage anyone with information to contact us immediately. Gonzalez was an inspiration to her friends and family and loved by many, a 2001 flyer offering a $20,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of her murder said, Stars and Stripes reported. At the time of her murder, Amanda was pregnant and looking forward to sharing her life and love with her daughter, who would have been born on March 26, 2002, it said. Her father told Stars and Stripes in 2008 that he had spent years hoping for answers in her case. It's frustrating as hell, Santos Gonzalez told Stars and Stripes in 2008. That was my first daughter, my only daughter. I know she had been in a struggle, he said. I want some answers and maybe get a little closure. For Gonzalez's mother, Gloria Bates, the pain of her loss is immeasurable. They took away my daughter and first grandchild, Bates told Stars and Stripes in 2008. But I've actually forgiven whoever killed her daughter. I've found it in my heart. Wilkerson pleaded not guilty at a hearing Thursday, according to a court filing, Stars and Stripes reports. If convicted, Wilkerson faces a maximum penalty of life in prison. He is charged under the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act, which gives the U.S. federal courts jurisdiction over crimes committed outside of the U.S. by, among others, former members of the armed forces who are no longer subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the DOJ statement said. The FBI is investigating the case. It is unclear whether Wilkerson has retained an attorney who can speak on his behalf. The Lancaster County District Attorney's Office and Pennsylvania State Police have filed charges in connection to the 1984 murder of 25-year-old Marianne Bakenstos in Pequia Township. 
The Pennsylvania State Police say they have charged 67-year-old Jerry Baconstows, Marianne's estranged husband, of the 100 block of West Willow Road with one count of criminal homicide. Authorities say he is currently being held at the Lancaster County Prison without bail. An arrest in this 38-year-old case has certainly been long awaited, Lancaster County District Attorney Heather Adams said. This is not a case solved with DNA. Rather, the arrest of Jerry Baganstos is the result of decades of hard work and dedication by law enforcement personnel, beginning in 1984 with members of the Pequia Township Police Department and continuing with numerous criminal investigators in the Pennsylvania State Police leading up to the present day. It was their dedication to the pursuit of justice in this case and their willingness to devote resources to this investigation, combined with the review and analysis of the decades-long investigation and evidence compiled in this investigation by attorneys in my office that culminated in and led to this arrest today. Marianne Bagenstos disappeared from her home on West Willow Road on June 5, 1984. Authorities say in June 1984, 25-year-old Marianne Bagenstos was separated from her estranged husband, Jerry, and resided at the West Willow Road home with her two-year-old son, who was shared with Jerry, and a boarder with whom she had a relationship. In April of that year, Marianne was granted custody of her son. However, a formal custody hearing was upcoming and scheduled for June 15 of that year, according to authorities. Marianne was described as a devoted mother to her son, who people say would have never been left behind. Marianne did not appear at the custody hearing and Jerry was awarded custody of their son, police say. Jerry was the last person to see Marianne alive, according to authorities. Police say one of Marianne's family or friends have been contacted by her since the day of her disappearance. The investigation into the disappearance of Marianne began on June 7, 1984, when authorities were contacted by Marianne's mother who learned that her daughter had not returned home for two days. Jerry never reported the mother of his child missing, according to authorities. Police say they spoke to Jerry on multiple occasions, who told them that he last saw Marianne alive on June 5, 1984, when he arrived at the house that morning to take Marianne to trade in her car. Jerry relayed that he took his son to Long's Park because Marianne was not ready to go. He claimed that when he returned home, Marianne was not there and had left a note that she had walked to the Turkey Hill in Willow Street and that he had not heard from her since. On June 8, 1984, a Pequia Township police officer spoke with Jerry at the West Willow Road address. The officer observed a piece of cardboard covering freshly dug dirt during a check of the garage. He lifted the cardboard and observed a digging area that measured approximately 3 feet by 5 feet. A search warrant was executed on June 13, 1984, based on these observations. The hole in the garage was reopened and measured 3 feet by 6 feet and was approximately 5 feet deep. The body of Marianne was not located, authorities say. However, investigators discovered a note when conducting the search warrant on June 13, 1984. The note was found crumbled in a wooden nail keg in the living room beside the couch and stated, had to run a quick errand, be right back. It was seized and retained as evidence at PSP Lancaster. Police say additional evidence gathered and relied on over the course of the investigation and cited in the affidavit of probable cause includes the following. Records obtained from Jerry's place of employment indicated that he had an unexcused absence for June 5, 1984, the date of Marianne's disappearance. Jerry had an unexplained injury to his left arm which was covered by a bandage. He provided inconsistent statements to law enforcement on how and where he injured himself. Jerry provided multiple inconsistent statements to police on what the note left by Marianne said, why he would have dug a hole in his garage near days after the victim's disappearance, why he was present at the house that day, and what Marianne was doing when he arrived. The defendant stated that Marianne was having car trouble and walked to a store. Interviews with the victim's neighbors and acquaintances revealed the car was working fine in the days leading up to the victim's disappearance. An assistant manager at Turkey Hill stated she had not seen Marianne at the store on the day of her disappearance. Jerry told officers during the search warrant that the note did not say she was walking to Turkey Hill and that he only assumed that Marianne went to the Turkey Hill. A maintenance supervisor at Long's Park related he had not seen the defendant's vehicle in the park on June 5, 1984, after being provided a picture of the vehicle. Two additional employees also had not seen the vehicle. In 1985, Jerry told investigators that people had relayed to him they recently saw Marianne. The defendant allegedly never reported this information to police. 
multiple notes and postcards sent to Jerry purportedly from Marianne were never relayed to the police by the defendant, authorities say. In late 2018, investigators with the Pennsylvania State Police began reworking this investigation focusing on a note that was seized during the June 13, 1984 search warrant at the West Willow Road residence. Investigators searched online databases to obtain public records and other documents containing the writing of the defendant. This initial gathering of data led to the execution of a search warrant at the same residence on September 20, 2022. Troopers seized numerous items that allegedly contained the handwriting of the suspect. The handwriting samples collected by investigators were submitted to the Pennsylvania State Police Bureau of Forensic Services, Harrisburg Regional Laboratory for Forensic Analysis. The analysis compared handwriting contained on a note recovered by police on June 13, 1984, purportedly explaining her whereabouts, to the items seized on September 20, 2022. The findings in the report stated the note recovered by police in 1984 was written by Jerry Bagenstos, authorities say. Officials say the body of Marianne has never been recovered in this decades-long investigation. Investigators cite the following factors to establish that this is not a missing persons case. None of the victim's associates or family have been contacted by her since her disappearance. Multiple checks of police, federal, and open-source databases have not been able to locate the victim. No evidence has been discovered that the victim packed belongings for a trip or to leave home. The victim has not opened any bank accounts or claimed income. There has been no activity on the victim's credit or social security number. The victim has not been discovered to have established residency or legal identification in other states or ever held a passport slash left the United States. Carol DeLeon's body was found in June 1981. More than four decades later, Larry Allen West has been charged with her murder. A San Antonio man has been arrested in connection with a murder case that has remained unsolved for more than four decades. Larry Allen West has been arrested and charged with the murder of Carol Joyce DeLeon, according to an arrest warrant. We've been suffering for over 40 years not knowing what happened to my sister, said Carol's sister, Sandra DeLeon. The potential of what she could have been, what she could have been will never be known. We were robbed of that, she was robbed of that. DeLeon was last seen on June 3, 1981, at a nightclub in San Antonio. Investigators said she had just graduated from Thomas Edison High School a few days before she died. The next day, a body was found on the grassy shoulder of Interstate 35 North near a rest area south of New Braunfels in Comal County. At the time, Texas DPS said that investigators tried to identify the body from fingerprints and missing person reports in the area but weren't able to identify her. She was buried in New Braunfels as a Jane Doe. She wasn't identified as DeLeon until 2009, according to Texas DPS. DeLeon had been shot six times in the head, according to an arrest warrant. An autopsy showed bruising on her neck, leading investigators to believe the suspect was forcibly holding or restraining the victim's neck. Although some of her clothes had been removed, investigators said there was no indication that DeLeon had been sexually assaulted. During the autopsy, fingernail scrapings were collected, and in 2010, 29 years after DeLeon's body was discovered, a DNA profile was created from the scrapings. However, after entering the DNA profile into the Cody system, investigators couldn't find a match. In 2019, 38 years after the murder, another sample of DNA was collected from DeLeon's body and matched the DNA collected from the fingernail scrapings. After that, the DNA was submitted for genealogy testing, which identified three persons of interest, including Larry Allen West. In November 2021, Texas Rangers visited West at his workplace in Converse, and he voluntarily gave investigators a swab of his DNA, according to an arrest warrant. According to police documents, West told investigators that in 1981, he often went to bars in Behar County to pick up younger women. He denied he had anything to do with DeLeon's murder. Then last month, Texas Ranger investigators said they got a break in the case, they received the DNA analysis report pointing to West as the best match, and the probability that the DNA found on DeLeon's body could be from someone else was nearly impossible. According to the arrest warrant, investigators said, Larry Allen West could not be excluded as the foreign contributor of this DNA profile. 
The probability of selecting an unrelated person at random who could be the contributor of this foreign DNA profile is approximately 1 in 422.1 quintillion. To know that she fought such a violent death at the end, she fought so hard for her life, it's just heartbreaking, Sandra said. Investigators also interviewed West's ex-wives, who described West as a violent person. According to an arrest warrant, West's first wife told investigators she was only married to West for 30 days, and during that time, he repeatedly assaulted and raped her. Sandra said her faith in God is what keeps her going every day as she's spent the past 40 years advocating for answers surrounding her sister's murder. She's hoping for closure at last. This is his chance before he leaves this earth to make his peace, come forth, give the rest of the family peace, Sandra said. I know that justice is going to come in one form or another. According to online court records, West was arrested Thursday. His bond was set at $125,000. In April, West posted bond and has been released from jail. West will be back in court for a pretrial hearing. In March of this year, the man who stands accused of murdering his biological daughter, Amore Wiggins, in the decade-old Opelika Baby Jane Doe case, reportedly made a shocking confession. He allegedly admitted to the killing during a videotaped police interview after waiving his Miranda rights. Lamar Vickerstaff faces felony murder charges, while his wife Ruth Vickerstaff, who is not Amore's biological mother, is charged with failing to report a missing child. The preliminary hearings for both defendants happened Wednesday, a judge did determine there is sufficient probable cause to proceed to a grand jury. Opelika police detective Alfred White took the stand for prosecutors and testified Lamar Vickerstaff admitted to killing Amore, but claimed he did not abuse her before her death. Detective White said some of Vickerstaff's statements were creditable, but detectives questioned other details he shared. He repeatedly said he did it, and he wanted his wife not to be charged, and that is what he was seeking in some sort of deal he wanted to make. He advised he traveled with her, Amore, from Virginia to Alabama, and he stated once he made it to Alabama, he drove around. He recalled placing her, Amore, where she was ultimately found. He did not give details as to how he did it, but he advised he did attempt to resuscitate her, Detective White testified. Detective White says when he asked Lamar how he killed Amore, he denied causing the injuries up to her death, but said when he returned from deployment is when he had to get rid of his daughter. During Detective White's testimony, we also learned Virginia Child Protective Services was called to investigate an anonymous report of abuse and injuries to Amore when she was in the care of Ruth. According to Detective White, Ruth admitted CPS had been called, but she claims CPS said everything was fine. Detective White testified Opelika police are trying to get a hold of the CPS records in Virginia, however, the records cannot be found by CPS workers in Virginia at this time. Detective White testified although Ruth initially denied knowing Lamar had a daughter, she later admitted to knowing Amore existed. Detective White said Ruth claims the last time she saw Amore her father was taking her to his relatives in Alabama, and Ruth never thought about asking about Amore again. Lamar Vickerstaff is currently being held at the Lee County Detention Facility without bail. Ruth Vickerstaff was released on a $10,000 and can now travel to Jacksonville, Florida with an ankle monitor per the judge's order on Wednesday. Lee County prosecutors had asked the judge not to allow Ruth to leave Alabama, claiming they received an anonymous phone call saying Ruth had already been traveling back to Florida even though the judge had ordered her to stay in Alabama. Meanwhile, according to court documents, a witness statement puts Lamar Vickerstaff in Opelika during the estimated time of Amore Wiggins' death between 2010 and 2011. Additionally, we learned Vickerstaff has ties to the exact area where her remains were recovered and how he went AWOL from the Navy before a scheduled meeting with Opelika police in Florida. Vickerstaff's AWOL from the Navy is one reason why the judge decided to deny Lamar Vickerstaff's defense attorney's request for bond under Anaya's law. On January 28, 2012, Opelika police responded to Brookhaven Trailer Park, located at 1775 Hearst Street in Opelika, Alabama, about skeletal remains being found. A skull was located in the yard of a residence while the majority of the bones were located only a few feet into the wood line behind a trailer and the adjacent lot. During the search of the area, a pink child's shirt and a small bundle of curly hair were also recovered. The remains were sent to the FBI laboratory in Quantico, Virginia, where a medical examination was performed. 
The report stated that the remains were of a black female likely between four to seven years of age who became affectionately known to the community as Baby Jane Doe. An autopsy was performed and notated fractures to her skull, arms, legs, shoulders, and ribs, totaling more than 15 individual fractures that were attributed to blunt force trauma. Opelika's Baby Jane Doe case is as complicated as it is tragic. The following timeline of events explains what we've learned so far and how Amore Wiggins was identified, and her dad and his wife arrested. January 1, 2006, Amore Wiggins born in Virginia to mother Ms. Sherry Wiggins. 2009, Amore's father, Lamar Vickerstaff, and wife Ruth obtain legal, physical custody. 2009 to 2022, Sherry Wiggins pays child support to Vickerstaff for Amore. Visitations suddenly stop and Wiggins goes to court trying to regain custody of Amore. January 28, 2012, Opelika Baby Jane Doe case born. Tiny skull remains found at Brookhaven Trailer Park in Opelika, Alabama. 2012, remains sent to FBI laboratory in Quantico, Virginia for examination. Remains are black females between 4 to 7 years of age. Autopsy reveals more than 15 fractures attributed to blunt force trauma, evidence of healing and malnourishment. Death determined a homicide, believed to have occurred between the summer of 2010 to 2011. 2012 to 2022, police review 15,000 case files and investigate thousands of tips. 2016, Picks surface of girl taken at Opelika's Greater Peace Baptist Church Bible School around 2011. Police believe girl may be baby Jane Doe. January 2022, DNA extracted from remains for genealogy testing. October 2022, Jane Doe's father, Lamar Vickerstaff Jr., identified. Vickerstaff was born and raised in Opelika, Alabama. Police say he had family, friends who lived near remains location. During U.S. Navy career, he resided in Norfolk, Virginia, Honolulu, Hawaii, and Jacksonville, Florida. December 2022, Opelika detectives notify Vickerstaff Jr. of his daughter's death and interview him and wife Ruth Vickerstaff. Couple does not provide information on identity of Jane Doe. December 2022, Amore Wiggins identified as baby Jane Doe. Detectives meet with Sherry Wiggins, DNA confirms she is biological mother. Wiggins provides docs showing Lamar and Ruth Vickerstaff obtained legal and physical custody in 2009. December 2022, detectives reach out to school boards, pediatric clinics in several states and determine Amore was never enrolled in school nor reported as missing. January 1, 2023, Amore Wiggins would have celebrated her 17th birthday. January 17, 2023, Lamar and Ruth Vickerstaff arrested in Jacksonville, Florida Lamar, charged with felony murder. Ruth arrested for failure to report a missing child under asterisk Kaylee's law. The Opelika community was left reeling on January 28, 2012, when tiny skeletal remains were discovered at the Brookhaven Trailer Park off Hearst Street. The remains were determined to be a young black female between the ages of 4 and 7. An autopsy revealed more than 15 fractures attributed to blunt force trauma, evidence of healing, and malnourishment. The child's death was determined to be a homicide, believed to have occurred between the summer of 2010 and 2011. For the next decade, the Opelika Police Department dedicated themselves to uncovering the truth, returning a name to the little girl, and justice for those who had killed her. Opelika Police attempted to develop a DNA profile for Jane Doe, however, but were unsuccessful due to the condition of the remains. Fortunately, with advancements, in January of 2022, DNA was further extracted for genealogy testing. Othram Labs successfully extracted DNA from the scalp and Astria Labs from the hair. A comprehensive genealogical profile was built. Once uploaded, an experienced genealogist used the profile to identify baby Jane Doe's relatives and investigative leads. Thank you for watching, make sure you subscribe and like the video, and click the bell icon to stay tuned.